So I'll present a, a shortish paper and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Um, it was great at getting that sense of what your project is about. I can see it's really broad ranging and I'm, I'm not quite sure where the conversation might go. So I'll keep the formal bit relatively um, compressed and, and leave more time for informality in, in conversation and, and more open discussion. Uh, so over the past decade, young people's access to online pornography and their participation in mediated sexual activities, including the production and sharing of sexually explicit images or sexts, have become a significant area of concern for educators, professionals, legislators, policymakers, and parents. Sexting controversies in particular have provoked debates between policy approaches, which primarily seek to protect young people from potential digital harms, and those that seek to recognize and support young people's legal and ethical rights to sexual self-expression in digital spaces, what we might term their rights to sexual citizenship. These debates are complex and dynamic, engaging with involving, evolving understandings of sexual consent and rapidly shifting definitions of what public and private information might mean in digital contexts. So in terms of my background, again, for a bit of context, um, I completed most of a graduate certificate in adult education in the early 2000s, but I didn't graduate. Um, I am not formally trained in secondary education or in public health, um, but I have spent um, over 20 years adjacent to these spaces, um, working in an advisory capacity for departments of education um, and departments of health. And I've also worked as an educator and facilitator myself um, uh, with people living with HIV, but I also was an educator and facilitator in the space of sexual ethics. Um, I designed and delivered a sexual ethics program for professional footballers and youth athletes for the Australian National Rugby League in the early 2000s. Um, I'm currently advising um, a philanthropic foundation here in Australia on a project that aims to prevent online abuse, um, specifically working with young men. But primarily, I am a media and communications researcher with foundational training in cultural studies and media production. So while I'm interested in the ways that both adults and young people negotiate safety, risk, well-being, pleasure and play in digital cultures, I'm equally interested in institutional and organizational responses to these practices, including policy responses. And my current future fellowship, which I'm just embarking in um, on this uh, as of the last month, funded by the Australian Research Council, um, is looking at uh, digital literacies and data literacies within sexual health organizations. Um, but much of my research to date has focused on understanding how and why young people engage in practices of producing, requesting, viewing, sharing, and curating sexual texts and images, and that includes commercially produced images and self-produced images. The other part of my work has focused on how and why adults define these practices as problems and when they're considered to be problems and when they're not considered to be problems um, and how problems might be redefined in order to both increase digital and sexual literacies among young people, but perhaps more urgently to increase literacies within adult settings. So how well do sexual health promotion people or educators understand digital cultures is a primary question for my work. Um, and through this work, I've become very aware that the majority of adult educators in Australia, at least, feel very under-resourced in terms of access to theoretical frameworks and practical frameworks that they can use to help them think about 
and understand the really rapidly changing digital sexual cultures. And this makes it incredibly difficult for them to facilitate sensitive conversations with young people that will allow young people to articulate the rights and responsibilities that they associate with mediated sexuality. So I've conceptualized digital sexual citizenship as a tool for thinking through these issues. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about the background or the, the kind of principles that have, have brought me to, to that thinking. So I'll start with some definitions of the child, messy as they may be, that kind of give us a sense of how complex this space is or what, what is a young person, what is a child. Um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of the Child defines all young people aged under 18 as children. But as Sonia Livingston and her colleagues note, many UN publications further define the category of young people as 15 to 25 year olds. Um, and this broadly overlaps with the ways that young people are understood in Australia, where youth focused services often target a really broad range um, from as young as 12 to as old as 29 in the youth category. Um, so it's clear the category of youth is a slippery one, um, but when I am thinking about digital sexual citizenship, uh, in my mind, I'm primarily mapping it on to 15 to 25 year olds. And this is the group that I find quite interesting because they are liminal in a sense, they are in the space of emerging adulthood in a kind of um, transitional area with a really broad range of legal rights and responsibilities across um, different areas of life. As Amanda Third and Philippa Collin observe, many digital citizenship strategies that are um, addressing the rights of young people foreclose the meaning of citizenship, reinscribing children and young people as citizens in the making or um, citizens in waiting, if you like, um, and reinforcing adult practices and institutions as the measure of legitimate citizenship. Um, despite this restriction of legitimacy though, young people's acts of citizenship, um, not so much the being or the doing of citizenship, if you like, have been increasingly recognized both in academic work and within the broader public sphere. Similarly, over the past decade, young people's sexual citizenship, particularly their rights to self-determination and self-expression in relation to sexuality and gender identity, has become central to political activism and scholarship in uh, the fields of um, LGBTQ plus rights and also um, feminist uh, conversations about sexual and reproductive rights. As Rosalind Pacheski notes, rights claims can take the form of both positive rights, that is freedoms to, and negative rights or freedoms from. However, the categories of positive rights and negative rights are not antithetical. So if we think about sexuality, the ability to take pleasure in one's own body and one's own desires is contingent on what Pacheski claims are a range of ethical principles that must be supported by enabling conditions and material resources that include, but are not limited to, freedom from violence and freedom from sexual coercion. In her remarks on the difficulties encountered by feminists who sought recognition for adult women's sexual rights within human rights frameworks in the late 1990s, Pacheski asks, why is it so much easier to assert sexual freedom in a negative rather than an affirmative or emancipatory sense? To gain consensus for the right not to be abused, exploited, raped, trafficked or mutilated in one's body, but not the right to fully enjoy one's body. And so while Pacheski applies this to adult rights, I'm interested in thinking what this means about the rights of 
emerging adults, as I say, um, young people. Um, and and uh, I know that Manfred has already talked a little bit about um, uh, Martha Nussbaum's capabilities approach, but I, I will just note in passing then that um, I won't go into detail to that um, work, but I'll, I'll note in passing that Martha Nussbaum makes a similar case in her discussion of the capabilities approach to questions of human rights in the global development context. So while human rights frameworks might define both freedoms from and freedoms to, it is only possible to enact and take advantage of these rights when one has the capability to do so, Nussbaum argues. Nussbaum offers capabilities as an adjunct to rights, as a means of defining precisely the conditions that might need to be present in order to exercise one's rights, or in the context of my thinking to undertake acts of citizenship. And I would suggest that a recognition of young people's capabilities in relations to senses, imagination and thought, which um, Nussbaum lists under her capabilities for bodily integrity, would include um, freedom of access to information, political and artistic expression, and pleasurable encounters with digital platforms and technologies. These are things we need capabilities for in order to exercise our rights is what I'm arguing. Um, and these capabilities, I think, are fundamental for understanding what I would term the ordinary or everyday aspects of digital sexual citizenship. So the ways that digital sexual citizenship might be enacted. And here I'm drawing on the work of Ken Plummer uh, and his work on intimate citizenship, which overlaps in many ways with sexual citizenship. Um, and Plummer argues that access or not to representations, both other people's representations and representations of oneself, constitute a contested site in the sphere of intimate citizenship. And I would say when I'm thinking about digital sexual citizenship, it would encompass both rights to self-representation and to access representations created by others. Um, and if we kind of transpose literacy models onto this, I would, I would say it's about, you know, not just rights to read and often um, uh, discussions of digital literacy, education and, and curriculum are about reading correctly or reading critically, but also about the capacity to write for self-expression, for self-representation. And, and this is a space that's highly contested um, in legal conversations, particularly around young people's um, capacities online. So when I deploy the term digital sexual citizenship, I'm trying to better reflect on the ways that sexuality and gender are both expressed through, but also created by everyday encounters with digital technologies. Like other digital scholars, I'm interested in exploring the ways that ordinary digital practices like taking and sharing selfies or um, you know, vernacular self-portraits, casual pictures, or circulating memes or GIFs or hashtags um, or posting in a comments thread could be understood as participating in community or uh, a public sphere or indeed as acts of citizenship. What does this mean in terms of young people's um, public engagement and, and how, how that public engagement might be understood as political as well as personal or intimate. So follow, following um, the work of Diane Richards, Richardson and Jeffrey Weeks, who both really problematize the notion of citizenship as a kind of very contingent category, I take up the notion of digital sexual citizenship as a sensitizing concept, not an, or not, uh, sorry, I'm stumbling a bit, not as an ontology. So I'm not saying that digital sexual citizenship is an 
object as such, or that we should be able to create a checklist of already existing circumstances and practices that constitute digital citizenship or are an impediment to digital citizenship. Instead, I'm trying to think about digital sexual citizenship as a site of possibility. So where I talked about Pacheski's discussion of what are the material circumstances, what are the ethical conditions that would allow us to understand rights and responsibilities around freedoms too, in relation to se uh, sexuality and, and sexual rights. Um, digital sexual citizenship to me is a site where we can think about what needs to be in place or what conditions might need to be there for us to understand young people as agentic in the space of digital learning in both formal and informal learning and I appreciated that conversation before because much of this work doesn't take place within educational curricula it takes place through everyday encounters um, and I also um, want to think about um, digital sexual citizenship in relation to the kind of emerging discourses that we see in education and in health around the need for youth voice or youth participation. So if we're thinking about citizenship um, and, and young people as citizens, um, what is their role in shaping the policies or shaping the framework or shaping the conditions in which they are expected to exist. Um, and the question of youth voice has been really central to both academic and non-academic attempts to center youth participation in the space of citizenship. And, and I've been part of research projects in Australia and perhaps you have too in Europe that really seek to engage youth voice as, as part of um, reflection on existing practices or as part of co-design work that tries to develop new curricula or new policy. But one of the issues that, that I've identified in relation to youth voice around um, uh, spaces like sexuality education or digital education is that, um, particularly in studies, for example, um, that are asking questions around sexting or asking questions around um, pornography use for young people. We seem to ask the same questions over and over again. In, in Australia, there are endless studies about why do people access pornography instead of formal sex education? And what are they learning from it? And what do they see as the gaps in sex education curricula? We know the answers. It's been the same answer for the past 20 years in every study that's been conducted. And it was, you know, pretty much the same answers in research pre-internet as it is in research post-internet. So why do we keep asking? Um, to paraphrase my, my colleague, um, Tanya Dreyer, who is a, a media scholar, um, one of the key questions I would say for um, thinking about youth voice in this space is not just who has a voice when we're asking questions about sexual citizenship or digital citizenship and what policy should be or what curriculum would be, but um, who is listened to in these policy spaces. So we might consult or we might run um, a, a youth voice study, but what changes as a result? Having a voice is only conduit to change if others listen. And so to this end, the notion of digital citizenship has been quite valuable for my thinking around gender and sexuality in digital cultures. Um, it's helped me slow down my inquiry into these cultures and tease out the contradictions at play in what Lauren Berlant has termed intimate publics. Um, and here, I think we're really um, beginning to look at the tensions between the public sphere and the private sphere or the changing notions of public and private that make many people so uncomfortable when it comes to young people's sexual expression in digital spaces. The notion that young people are 
um, not concerned with privacy anymore, for example, or that they are making public what should be private. Um, in their edited collection, Digital Intimate Publics, Amy Shield Dodson and her colleagues survey a range of literature addressing the contradictions at play in discussions of publics and intimacies. As they note, popular anxieties around young people's digital practices are most often tacitly framed by unspoken rules around appropriate sexual norms and appropriate forms of gendered expressions. At the same time, the networked publics or the digital publics that young people inhabit are both enabled and constrained by local and international regulations the commercial interests of social media platform owners and app developers, and the cultural and subcultural contexts in which media content is produced and shared. So some of the classical um, ways that we have tried to investigate youth practices have been very based on individual choice um, or individual subjectivity or individual decision-making practices. But as, as Dobson and her co-authors put it, the ways that people use social media make it increasingly difficult to sustain the illusory separation of politics from intimate life, of both chosen and unchosen identities in politics and the illusion of the private heteronormative family as the ideal primary source of intimacy and pleasure rather than broader communities and publics. So here, um, I think it's quite useful to think about the breaking down of public and private boundaries and the notion that, for example, the family is the site of appropriate sexual learning. These are sites that are challenged by digital cultures. And I think this is why they become so complex and problematic for discussion in classrooms. Um, the language of digital sexual citizenship, I think, can shift adult inquiries into adult, into young people's sexual cultures away from excessive reliance on both universal theories of child development, which were very commonly relied on by the teachers I talked to in Australia when I was investigating where they learned about digital culture and young people's practices and also away from hyper individualized focus on individual psychology that really um, look for behavior change interventions, if you like. Um, these are both kind of very individualized approaches to young people's um, uh, conditions of being, I guess, um, and, and really don't take account for the, the ways that digital cultures um, engage young people in collective practices of learning or participatory practices of learning. So I would suggest as, as I um, wrap up that a consideration of digital sexual citizenship may be um, incomplete or um, provocative in some ways, but hopefully it's a space in which adults can attend to young people's positive rights or freedoms to access and participate in digital cultures as much as they think about protection in those spaces. Um, and it particularly invites us to think about how digital cultures intersect with young people's rights to access information about sex, sexuality and gender and to think about the ways that one might choose to participate, but also not to participate, to abstain from media practice or media culture as an act of agency, or as we might say, an act of citizenship. And I'll leave it there because that was all very abstract and not very applied. I was trying to be more abstract because the articles are more applied that I shared, but um, I'm really happy to talk about um, specific studies or specific instances of research that have led me to um, try and tease out these concepts.